good. <laughs> hey, well, hey, everyone. It's December 26, 2018, and it's your episode 172 of At Percussion. I'm your host, Casey Cangelosi, and with me, as usual, are Megan Arns. Hello. And Carly Vina's back on the show. She is going to be in our regular rotation of co-hosts. So, hey, Carly, how's it going? Hey, everybody. And Ben Charles is here. Hey, everybody. Ben, do you know what I'm drinking right now? Uh, I don't. I mean, yeah, you, yeah, you wouldn't, but it's <laughs> it's the holidays. <laughs> so I kind of am curious, are you guys eggnog people or not? Because no one's in the middle. I'm Neil like, no eggnog. Middle. No it's, eggnog. It's all right. I don't Neil, seek it out, Neil, but I'll drink it if it's there. Neil's shaking his head hard. That's probably for the best, y'all, because eggnog is really bad for you, and I really like eggnog. <laughs> Yeah, I drink it if it's there. I'm more of a mulled wine person. That what's that have to do with Christmas though? <laughs> that's a wine drink. That's totally episode. a Christmas drink. What oh, do it you is? mean? I'm sorry, I've never even heard of that. Mulled wine? Oh, sorry, I've never even heard of eggnog. <laughs> <laughs> I really hadn't heard of that. What? No. Ben, have you heard of that? I no, have. I was just thinking of a hot toddy. I don't know what that is, but I know it's I a wintry drink. No, sorry, I really don't know what mulled wine is. It's a uh, wine. It's hot. It, it's warmed up. It's heated okay. up, and and um, it, there's a bunch of spices that you can. It's add like to mulled it. apple cider, but with wine. Oh, yeah. okay, it's great. Oh, well, well, there you go. Well, something <laughs> I was gonna say real quick. <laughs> We we aim to educate on this show, so this is going good as far as <laughs> I can true. tell. This is education, yeah. Well, but but speaking of the holidays, and of course, as usual, it's going to be way past the holiday by the time this episode airs because we're I think we're over a month ahead, which is more than I, I really ever mean to do. <laughs> but <laughs> I found this interesting website called Charity Navigator. It's just a search engine, and it's got a lot of it's got a lot of pop-ups and ads and those things. That's how it, it runs itself. But if you type in music into the search, you will find so many charitable music organizations. And they'll tell you what their classification is. Sometimes it says you know, charitable organization. Sometimes it says educational organization. I found one that is cruelty to uh, prevention of cruelty to animals classification. And there are so many. Like under music is over a thousand uh, that that it finds under jazz is uh, some I think it's at six hundred and eighty six. So yeah, if you're feeling charitable and you ever want to do something charity wise uh, for music, but you're just not sure what to look for or what you might be interested in, I guarantee if you're willing to hunt for one, there's one that's really really good. So I, there was one called uh, Cats Jazz I really like. That was uh, prevention of cruelty to animals. For some reason, that to me really like comes to the front of my mind. And another one that was cool is called Notes for Notes Organization. And that one, they specifically seek out to set up recording and performance spaces in uh, girls and boys clubs. Um, so am I saying that right? Boys, boys and girls club, whatever that is, the inner city uh, clubs, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. Boys, yeah. and girls, boys and girls club. Yeah, Boys and Girls Club. Yeah, thank you. So anyway, there's so many there, and there's like tons we could Very highlight. Cool. Maybe it should be a maybe it should be a, a topic someday that we we really focus on, like uh, a couple of them or just one of them. But yeah, there's there's well over a thousand there. So just in the holiday spirit, and yeah. So let's see. Let's go ahead and introduce our guest, you all. He's um, he's someone I've known for oh, many many years now, and. He's made a career performing with uh, some of the best symphonies in the world, for sure. And uh, probably the foremost of them being the Boston Symphony Orchestra, but also the Boston Pops. And he's the founder of, I mean, there's the world-famous world famous percussion company, Grover Pro Percussion. So it's our, it's our buddy, Neil Grover. How's it going, Neil? Hello, everybody. Happy holidays. It's going well. Yeah, it's going I'm well. Sure. I'm crawling till the end of the year on all fours. Oh, okay. You're almost there. Yeah, you're very close. Almost. It's, just a couple days. I, yeah. So, you know, Neil, you were kind enough to have me on your Facebook mm-hmm. page for a little interview. And something that you just kind of said really casually was like, well, when I was having a coaching with Oliver Messian on Exotic Birds, he did this, 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 and that. And one time I heard John Williams say this, 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 and this. And I just wanted to ask you, who else have you, have you played under or have you 
worked alongside because you were dropping these famous names. Well, I didn't mean to be a name dropper, but I guess when you're old, (laughs) it's just, you know, Abraham Lincoln was somebody I knew. And right. uh, (laughs) um, Actually, I was fortunate to be able to um, have a, a, a fellowship to Tanglewood for many years and then spent seven summers at, at Marlboro Music Festival as the only percussionist there. So I got to work with a lot of really great um, musicians. Uh, I think what, to that stand out, one summer I was at Tanglewood and both Aaron Copeland and Leonard Bernstein were there and we worked with them. And just meeting Copeland, getting to talk to him, Leonard Bernstein was an idol of mine growing up in New York in the sixties, you know, the New York fell with Bernstein and Saul Goodman on timpani was for me, was it, it as a kid. Um, so it, I've never, I've never been that shy about going up to people and introducing myself and say, hi, I'm a, I'm Neil Grover. I'm a percussionist. Can I talk to you for five minutes? And everybody has been very, very nice along the way. Yeah. Can you, would yeah. you mind retelling that little Messian story that you told well, me? Well, the Messian thing we were working on exotic birds, it, at Tanglewood in the shed there, which is an out amphitheater. And it, I don't think Messian was that happy with the way things were going. And he, he made us stop the rehearsal and sit there for about 20 minutes, just listening to the birds in the rafters. He just wanted us to listen, not, not play, not talk, just sit there and listen. And after 20 minutes, just sitting there listening and thinking about it, when rehearsal progressed, it was much, much better, and he seemed much happier. And, you know, sometimes it's not just, to me, it's just not about practicing. It's not about woodshedding, if that's important. But I always felt it was important as well to understand musically what's going on, get outside of the measures, get outside of my own head. So yeah. as an example, when I was studying um Music, I was learning La Mer or uh, La Vol, something uh, impressionistic. I'd always go to the art museum and look at the impressionistic paintings and walk around and plug my Walkman in. At that time, it was a Walkman and listen to the music while I was looking at what the painters were doing, you know, because all the painters and musicians were hanging out in Paris sharing ideas. And it was a whole movement. So I always thought it's more important for me holistically to approach music holistically as a is a musician rather than just notes on a page. Yeah, really nice. So in Messiaen, he didn't like, he didn't say anything specific. He just listened no. to these birds. And what did, what did that relax everyone? Or I don't no, know. Well, it, it was yeah. the exotic birds. He, wo- he wanted us to get kind of the sound the birds make in our head, even though the birds at Tangwood aren't exactly exotic. Um, there's a certain kind of pitch contour and attack and he, he wanted us to get bird sounds in our head. He knew we mm-hmm. knew the parts. I mean, I was sitting here woodshedding the parts for hours, you know, and, and um, it didn't seem that important to him whether I was playing all the right notes yeah. as much as getting the feel and the sound of what he wanted from the birds. Yeah. That's yeah. cool. Well, I think Ben has a Facebook question there. Ben, is that right? Yeah, well, it's sort of a Facebook question. I want to tack on my my own question as well. Um, but a while back, we had Ron Samuels, the founder of Marimba One, on the podcast. And I also remember a few years ago, I think it was Cooperman was inducted into the PAS Industry Hall of Fame or something like that. Um, but I remember, like, one thing that comes up with those companies and your company a lot is you have these companies that have been around for years that have been making just wonderful products. And every single product has your name stamped on it, which I think is like a testament to how you feel about those products. And I feel like the story of the the founding of these companies isn't always, uh, I mean, you don't write a book about your own company generally. Um, so could you tell us about the, the sort of founding of Grover Pro Percussion? And then Scott Burton sent in a Facebook question and he said, how is it that the three members, sorry, that three members of the Boston Symphony Percussion Section each created their own percussion products companies? Did Grover, Geiger, and Firth help each other out or did each work independently? And for Frank Epstein with Cassidance. Um, uh, the founding, it was a complete accident. It, it, it was something I didn't want. And I questioned whether it was, it just kind of happened. What ha- the, the story, I was playing in the Boston Symphony. I was playing Triangle and Scheherazade. It was one of the first gigs I played at Symphony Hall with the Boston Symphony. And Vic Firth, who was my teacher at the time, handed me this old uh, Leedy Triangle. 
and it sounded unbelievable. It had sparkle, it shimmered. I never heard anything like it. It sang. And I was asking Vic about it, and you know, nobody seemed to understand why it sounded so good. And it was driving me crazy, and I wanted to understand what was going on, because I don't believe in magic. I believe in physics and acoustics and metallurgy. So at the time, I had a former classmate from high school who was going to MIT when I was going to uh, NEC. So I, between rehearsals, I threw the triangle in my bag, and I ran over to see him at MIT. And he was an amateur violinist, and I explained what was, what was really bothering me in terms of, I want to understand why that triangle sounded so good. So he brought me to the head of the, the at the time, the head of the uh, acoustics and vibrations lab was a man who was an amateur flute player and was studying with a friend of mine in the Boston Symphony. So he brought me in to talk to him, and he assigned a student uh, who needed a project uh, to work with me to understand why a triangle had a certain sound, what that sound, first of all, I didn't know what the sound was. At the time, nobody was talking about overtones in a triangle. People weren't taking triangles very seriously. You know, Alan Abel made a good triangle, but that was really just a spindle, copy of a spindle triangle that was made in New England at the turn of the century from old knitting, knitting, knit, knitting mill spindles. That's another story. But, um, so to make a long story short, they worked with me to understand and help me help me really educate me in terms of metallurgy, what the metal was, the hardness, how it was shaped, and everything like that. So they gave me a blueprint. So I went to go find a blacksmith. And in those days, it was like 1977 or 8, um, there was still a shipyard in Boston that was, that was left over from World War II. And I went to go see one of the blacksmiths there. And I showed him the triangle. I showed him what they told me at MIT, and I said, could you make one like this for me? He said, yeah, come back in a week. So I went back in a week, and he had one. He handed it to me, and I hit it, and it was unbelievable. It was identical. It sounded magnificent. He charged me $20. I handed him the $20, and that was the end. I, didn't, I was done, mm-hmm. or so I thought. So now I go back to a rehearsal, and instead of using the BSO triangle, I'm, I'm holding this other one. And Arthur Press, the assistant Timmons time, looks at me and says, what's that? I said, well, I had this made. It was a copy. He said, well, would you make one for me? I said, well, I'll, yeah, I'll call the guy. So to make a long story short, I made them for different people in Boston initially. Then I started getting calls from people. Doug Howard in Texas called me and said, hey, I heard you're making triangles. And I was telling people, no, I'm not. I, I, I'm, I'm not doing right. this. I get a call one day from this very unusual voice. Uh, and Neil Grover, yes, this is Harvey Vogel at Lone Star Percussion. And this, I never heard of Lone Star. It was a brand new company. He said, I heard you're in the triangle business. And I said, no, I, that's not right. I, I'm not. He says, well, well you, you are, are now. now. You yeah. are now. <laughs> and he ordered Rumors. a couple of dozen. Yeah. So at that time, I'd never been to, pa- it was like just one or two PASICs. So I decided, well, let me see, you know, maybe I could sell some triangles at this convention. I'd never been. So I made two dozen triangles and went to the show and I was just praying that I sold all of them. So I had money really to come home and, uh, I got a little table and I printed up one page flyer based on uh, what Fred Hinger's flyers were like. He kind of helped me and, uh, I put it out there and I sold all the triangles in an hour. What, what and, year again? Sorry. Uh, like what? 1980. Cool. Yeah. 80. And I'm sitting there, but when I tell you I sold every triangle, I sold every triangle and like an idiot. I didn't keep one back. So now I had nothing to show people for three more days. So I had to buy back one of the triangles I had sold to somebody. Wow. I had to beg them to sell it back to me, and I made him another one. That's uh, awesome. And that kind of started it. And it was not anything that was planned. It was uh, – I equated to taking a little dog for a walk, and now I'm being dragged through the street by a, a pack of wolves. Right. And it's just kind of dragged me for the next 35 years. It just kept growing in spite of me, in spite of me. Well, Neil, this comes up over and over and over with people's success stories on the podcast. And it's this thing we've called the slow boil or, you know, the step by step that, you know, young people ask. I'm sure they ask you all the time. I want to start my own company. How do I do it? I want to be a publisher. How do I do it? I want to get my music out there. How do I do it? And it seems like over and over and over the answer is this thing you just described. It's like, well, you don't even really like know you're doing it until like 
it's kind of just happening, you know, right. because you do start so little. And you have to kind of make it up as you go along. I mean, in those days, there was no internet. It wasn't, I mean, there was a library, but you couldn't walk into the library and look up how to make a triangle in the encyclopedia. I mean, it just yeah. didn't exist. So I, the I first step for me you. was understanding what this, I asked myself, what should a triangle sound like? Nobody was asking it, the question. What should a well, triangle sound like? Right, yeah. right. Well, and I did want to, I do want to ask you actually just in, in totally, it, it, as, as if I have no idea how it's done because I actually don't. Um, at some point, how, how do you make a triangle? But anyway, I think Ben has a follow-up first. Sure, sure. Well, no, no, since we're on the topic, can, go ahead and tell us like, yeah, because Casey and I, before we got on, we're like, how, how the hell do you make a triangle? It's like, I know it's metal. <laughs> I mean, I know. But <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, yeah. It's very simple yet very complex. It, it, it's right. it, it's clearly it's just. I mean, you could look at it one one way. And say it's just a bent piece of metal. But what's metal? What kind of metal? What's right. the crystalline structure like? You know, metal is made up of of different atoms and different alloys have different properties, different hardnesses. Metals come in all these different hardnesses. Um, the sh it, believe it or not, in many ways, the exact shape is the least important thing. People think, oh, it's got to be isosceles or it's got to be equilateral. It, it, that has so little effect on it. It's mm -hmm. about basically about the crystalline structure of the metal. And there's different ways to harden metal. Uh, when something, if you think about a glass and a glass dropping and shattering that sound, the glass is brittle. It's hard. The harder something is, the more brittle it is. And we've actually hardened triangles to the point where I hit it and it shattered. The metal shattered because it was wow. too brittle. Cool. We, we always push the envelope because when things are really uh, brittle and hard, they resonate. You mm. know, if you think about lead, lead's a very soft metal. There's no sound that comes from lead. Copper's relatively not that hard. There's ways to harden it. Steel is very hard and, and can be hardened. Uh, brass is somewhere in the middle. So it's a matter of getting the material, doing certain processes to it, either with heat or, or pressure and hardening the metal. And, and in some ways, it's kind of like symbols, a Zildjian. Everybody knows the Zildjian secret is not in the composition. They've analyzed what's in there, how much copper, tin. It's in the processing of the metal, how they yeah. work the metal to get that sound. That's secret. And it's the same way with triangles. I mean, there's things we don't show anybody. Um, and everybody who works with me has to sign a non-disclosure. So they're bound contractually. And um, wow. we're, we're pretty protective about that. But you're going to show it today, right now, right? <laughs> oh, sure. You know, Susan, I really... That's what we advertise. You know, there's... Um, it, it's, it's not one thing. It's a whole bunch of things. Yeah. And a lot of yeah. it, the processes is... is, is the the sequence of processes yeah and what or you know think of it this way we make music with notes if i just handed you here are all these notes well the notes themselves are important but the sequence of the notes in many ways is more important than the actual notes yeah, yeah. and it's the same way in in uh working with uh, resonant metals and i'm guessing so woods I too yeah, yeah. So I have a couple other questions about uh, the the sort of business side of things. One is, and uh, like I said, there was this Facebook question that talked about, uh, Scott Burton was asking about the other BSO members. And I know I read a long time ago an article uh, about Lee Howard Stevens starting Malatech. And uh, he had originally been with Vic Firth and Vic Firth made uh, Lee Howard Stevens marimba sticks. They were called back in the old ads. And uh, Lee said that Vic, when he came to him uh, saying he wanted to start his own company, Vic was a total gentleman and was very happy to, you know, give him business advice and help him out and get him on his own way. So, and you kind of hinted that there was maybe some sort of uh, help between the different uh, Boston area musicians or well, at least some imitation. So it, could you speak yeah. to that a little bit? Well, everybody was very supportive. I mean, um, unlike Tom Gager and Vic, um, I was never a full member of the Boston Symphony. I was an extra player for many, many years. But I play. I was playing maybe 100, 150 concerts a year with them steadily. Um, uh, but Tom made bass drum mallets because he he had the bass drum chair in the Boston Symphony. Uh, Vic was always and Tom 
were always very supportive of what I was doing. They were very interested. They were very helpful. Now, Vic was a fierce competitor. If, if we did something that was competing with what he did, you know, he would, he would want to win. He was, he was one of the most competitive people I've ever met. He was also one of the nicest people I've ever met and, and supportive. Uh, it's interesting to bring up Lee Stevens because Lee, Mike, Bol- Mike Bolter, Lee and I all started around the same time. And the three of us are about the same age. The three of us are very good friends. And over many decades, there's times where I picked up the phone and called Lee for advice. Lee calls me. Lee and Mike and I talk all the time. Hey, do you, you know, there's been times where I needed to retain. I called Mike. Or, or Lee called me. He needed some advice on a lathe. And I helped him find a special lathe to do a job. Or, you know, we all, it's a small industry. We might as well help each other. Uh, pretty much. Um, so it's been very supportive in that way. That's so cool. But I, I don't know, like... the Boston Symphony, maybe it's the entrepreneurial spirit in New England. Uh, well, I don't know. Well, I know, Neil, in, in our conversation a week ago or so, we were talking about just people supporting each other, trying new things and composition or whatever. And, you know, something I said, it's like, I think people, who, even the people who don't like my music, they still support me. Like, they're still supportive of, yeah, like, cool you're doing something new that's that's great you know it's it's, it's interesting right, right so yeah it's just really nice to hear yeah, if that you don't try that if you don't try you, you, you know i mean the important thing to me is to try whether you succeed or not you know most of the things i've tried have failed yeah um, but i learn i make it a point to learn from my failures and this is something when i was a kid i used to really like to read about inventors like thomas edison samuel morse and edison had had tremendous failures tremendous but he always was able to use it as a learning experience. So I, I've never been afraid to make mistakes. I think it's good, you know, because yeah. it's the way I learn. It, it's a yeah. Uh, I think Carly had a question, or Ben, you have another one. Keep him talking. This is this is good. Yeah. Stuff. Well, I was going to ask. So I, I another sort of one of these things I've seen that's definitely struck a chord with me is I saw Bob Van Sice talking about developing some Irma mallets. And he talks a lot about time for marimba, how Minoru Miki made these extreme demands on the performer that, quite frankly, none of the implements in existence were, were good enough. And he had to develop his own you know, product, so to speak, to, to work on that. So could you tell us about some of the musical demands that you've uh, found from composers that you've had to sort of invent your own solution to? Sure. Well, I'll give you, I'll give you a, a, a fairly recent example a couple of years ago, we were playing La Vida Brave. It tangled with the Boston Symphony. And it has a kind of a complex little anvil part. I was not playing it. A colleague of mine was playing it. And um, uh, Rafael de Borges was conducting. And he did not like the sound of the pipes they were using. So they, he had them bring out all the pipes that the BSO had, the draws. He didn't like any of it. And my poor colleague was playing and the pipes are rolling. And I, I'm, I went, I went back to my room that night thinking this is this isn't the way to do it there's got to be a better way so i thought about making a musical anvil that is easy to play kind of like a marimba bar that could be tuned and i patterned it after our temple blocks which have a slit in them so I, it's basically a metal temple block so we came up with these anvils we were able to get two to three pitches out of each one uh they're easy to play they sound really uh resonant I mean, that, there's another thing. What should an anvil sound like? Is it dead? Should it ring? I mean, so, so I had to do an exhaustive search for anvil sounds on the Internet. And, uh, but there's an example where that was specific. That particular concert pushed me to say that this is unacceptable. Playing pipes like this for anvil sounds just is ridiculous. Neil, that might be my favorite thing you make is your anvil. Well, you use it in such great ways, Casey. Well, I, and I, I like using it incorrectly, too. I mean, I like right. hitting it with softer mallets. And right, I mean, there's right, just a lot right. of... And I heard a blacksmith, God, I don't know, a year ago or so, a blacksmith came to our to JMU and gave a little workshop for our, our Arts 100 class. And I remember thinking, like, when he hit the anvil, it was it's like, yes, Neil nailed it, A, but also you made something louder than a real anvil, from what I could tell. Because I yeah. thought... Okay, the real anvil, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a nice sound, but it's not that loud, actually. And no. your anvils can get really loud. And in the cases like the Holst, and I mean, anvils, yeah. they always need to be loud in these pieces. Right. right. Well, you know, composers wrote for anvil. They just probably heard it in, a, in um, 
right. blacksmith shop doing shoe horseshoeing or something like that. Heard this sound, I'm going to put it in the orchestra. Not yeah. thinking of the challenges of of assigning a, uh, a musical instrument terminology to something that's not a musical instrument. Yeah, which right, is kind of right. what we do. I mean, break drums is the same thing, you know. Yeah. It's, although at least with break drums, you get break you get some nice sounding break drums if you hunt around. Right. I don't know many right. people that actually slept real anvils into into yeah. uh, concert halls, and the ones that are sold as anvils never sounded like anvils to me. Calamity Coyote always seems to have an anvil. Calamity Coyote. Nobody, nobody, Roadrunner, Looney Tunes. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Oh. Me, me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry, Neil. These millennials, they that. don't know. I thought that was some like punk rock band you were into, Casey. <laughs> yeah, these, these, these generation, a, Casey. That's these generation an Acme, Y. That's made by the Acme Company. That's oh, that's right. Yeah. Actually, they yeah. they make yeah. all that stuff for Roadrunner. God, Here's competitors man. with Grover. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, Carly, I think you got something for us today, right? Um, I have a question um, first for Neil. As I hear you talk about, like, just how how complex and how how much clearly you know about just the triangles, and I'm sure um, everything else that you're making, snare drums and woodblocks and everything. I'm wondering how you balance um, your running your business, being the president, CEO, business owner, and then also your life, like being super active as a performer. I don't sleep much. No, it's um, <laughs> it's been it's been challenging. I mean, there are days where I would be at rehearsal, and then I come back to my office and go back for a concert. Um, over the years, I've assembled a really good staff. It's like a family. People have been with me a long time, and I trust them. So basically, I've slowly worked my way out of the day to day operations with a general manager and a sales manager and a production manager. And um, I never really set out, Carly, to want to be a business owner and, and a CEO. Um, I kind of avoided that when I was younger and wanted to be a musician. Uh, what dragged me into the music instrument business was creativity, wanting to be creative, making a sound or creating a sound or understanding what this, what is this, what should this sound like and how do we, how do we build something that will sound the way we want it to sound. So I've kind of uh, made it a point to try and stay as much into the creative side as possible. Like I love going out in the shop and experimenting, although the guys hate it when I go back there because I ask a million questions and <laughs> I have a tendency to micromanage, which is a very common thing amongst people who have started a business. But it's challenging. And now I'm at the kind of um, latter part of my career and I've actually pulled back a little bit from the day-to-day -day operations and I intend to do a pull back a little more and kind of be more on kind of the uh, strategic uh, planning side of things, but still stay in R and D. I, I like that. I like thinking of new things and building. I've, if you saw the desk, my desk at the office, it's piled with all kinds of junk, all <laughs> kinds of different triangles and casting nets and stuff, most of which that didn't work. <laughs> that's cool that's but how they it, say it's supposed to be it's yeah but i love it carly i, I think what what does it I, I look forward to it's not like going to a job i hate it's kind of like going to a performance and i enjoy it and uh but, I, you know the the connection that i see is that as musicians as performers we're always problem solving like no matter what you're solving some aspect of it and the same with teaching is solving really someone else's problem and it sounds like what you did is, is it happened organically that you're taking that from, um, you know, problem solving aspect and, and let's create this, let's design this. And you're exactly right. That's, you hit the nail on the head and, and it's, um, it, it's problem solving. It's being creative. Um, where, where I would really don't do well is when someone says to me, I want you to do this task and this is the way you're going to do it. I've never done well in those. I probably wouldn't have done well in the military um, because I like to find my own way to do. I like problem solving. I like to figure it out. So you're right. It's, it's the same skill set we all have used as young percussionists learning new skills or learning new music or figuring things out or um, problem solving. How, how do you get something to work right for your technique? It's just, it's just applied a little differently. Yeah, cool. Carly, you had something else for us today. I think we can give Neil a quick break and do your topic. 
I do, yeah. So I, I have uh, some somewhat humorous uh, anecdotes on teaching accessories in schools, especially middle schools and high schools, because um, I do a lot of work. Um, some schools that I'm at regularly and some schools I'll go and do one clinic and um, you know, I, I see what's happening there. And one of my favorite things to talk about is triangle and tambourine with these students because you see amazing things sometimes in these in these programs. Um, so I'll, I'll start with what I think is the most neglected instrument um, of the percussion family, or at least one of them, is the triangle. And the biggest problem that I see, and you guys feel free to jump in if, um, if, if you can add anything to this or if you've had similar, similar problems, but the, the triangle clips, I have seen incredible substitutions for triangle clips. Um, <laughs> I think that the worst one I've ever seen, the one that takes the cake was a oversized binder clip. Um, with a rubber band <laughs> clipped in, and then the triangle nice. hooked through the rubber band. So it's like bounce, 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 and <laughs> probably some yep. spinning around. Uh, or sometimes you see like a homemade <laughs> clip just with a really long piece of yarn, something like that, and the kid hits it, and it's like, woo. Um, and it's amazing. You know, sometimes it's, I think, every program's on a budget, but sometimes, the you know, a triangle clip is not that expensive. Um, mm. Sometimes it's just people don't know. People don't know. What's, what's needed, could, uh, and it's a real instrument. If I could interject, yeah, I mean, a triangle, the, the instrument itself is obviously, it's part of a system of the clip, the triangle, and the triangle beater. And I had a, a wind band conductor one time that said he, he just got back from doing like a high school honor band. He was like, I'm so glad to be back here conducting you at North Texas. He said, uh, he was talking about, you know, whenever they ask for a different mallet at UNT, everyone grabs and gra runs and grabs five different mallets. And he was saying he looked back and the triangle player was hitting the triangle with a bolt that he found on. The <laughs> and he said, do we have anything else that we can hit the triangle with? And the kid goes, yeah, I think I saw a nail around here somewhere. <laughs> you know, Carly, you've, you've hit course. the nail on the head. And I go into a lot of high schools. Recently, I went back to my old high school after 41 years. And you see things like battery cables from a car. And they wonder why the triangle's not ringing. Well, they're choking it. And I mean... It's amazing that people fixate and focus on the wrong things. Mm -hmm. It's like with snare drums. The most important things on a snare drum are the heads and the snares. The mm. throw-off just turns it on and off. It's digital. It's the least important part, as long as it functions. Yet people spend fortunes on these very fancy drums with fancy <laughs> snare mechanisms when they ignore the heads and the snares a lot of the time. Yeah, sure. So with the triangle, it's all about the clip. Even a bad triangle might sound acceptable if it's suspended properly. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, it, I actually have a box. Carly, if you, if you see anything that's really terrible, send yeah. it to me and I'll send you a few clips to replace it with. Because I keep a box of things not to use and I take it to music education shows yeah. and I show it to band directors. I hold them up. <laughs> I mean, that's some great. of it's unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's crazy stuff out there. Um, oh, it's incredible. It's just, you know, a triangle wants to ring, but you need to allow it to vibrate. And if you yeah. don't spend it properly, um, you know, uh, I mean, thank goodness we don't have to suspend our own vibraphone bars or the, all these vibraphones would be sounding awful. You know, it comes already <laughs> strung through the nodes, so it, so it rings. But... Um, Ha, Neil, have your clips evolved much in over the years, or no. it's mostly been very no, standard? No, and I don't know if that's good or bad. Um, some people, they have stayed the same. That that the, the wooden clips that we've been selling since 1980 started out when I was a teenager playing, studying in New York with, um, I studied with a percussionist from the NBC Symphony with Tuscanini. Tuscanini was dead, but he had played in the NBC Symphony. And they used to take these music clips for outside, these clips to hold music, and cut them yeah. off. And that's what it was. So I figured, uh, well, I'll pattern it after that. It's a wooden clip. Sure. And people say, well, shouldn't it be metal? And my answer is no. Metal's heavy. The last yeah. thing I want to do, I'm holding that up. The triangle's heavy enough. And a lot of the times I'm holding it up for a good amount of time. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to add weight. So to me, wood is the perfect material for that because it doesn't vibrate. It doesn't add any rattles or anything like that, and it's light. Now, you could say, well, it's not as durable as metal, and I, that's true, but if 
I mean, unless you do something really drastic to your triangle clip, it should last you a very, very, very long time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. So it has not evolved very much. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Other anecdotes, Carly? Yeah, sure. So the the next thing, Ben stole my thunder a little bit because I've definitely seen screws. Yes, he used does. Computers. Um, I've also seen this was creative a broken off wind chime bar. And oh that's yeah, computer. that's good. Yes. Um, it looks about the right size and shape, so why not? <laughs> um, Have you ever seen a spoon? <laughs> oh, that's new. Yeah. <laughs> Never. <laughs> that's new. That's good, Ben. But even. Even maybe more common is where are the triangle beaters, which is what spawns all of these other creative solutions. And and even schools that have cases and there's here's where the triangle beaters go, they still disappear. Um, it drives me insane at my school. Yeah. My students know. It's like, I just bought new Grover triangle beaters and I don't I can't find any. Oh, yeah, we think yeah. we left them over in Forbes and they're, don't worry, they're coming back. They do always come back. But it's like, uh, yeah. Maybe yeah, we need to enough. put a security, like a... a security cable on it, a really long security cable, Casey, <laughs> that you can bolt down to your office. I mean, the students are just so busy. They like, okay, I'm putting, the, and they are so, they're very diligent about it. They are, I mean, even when the situation is ideal, and there's a set of beaters over here, a set of beaters over there. They many of them have their own beaters, but I mean, I see them. They will. Okay, I'm picking up the beaters at 8 a.m. because that's my only window to have them in my bag because I like these beaters for my 3 p.m. rehearsal. And they'll do that, and then they'll put them back when they can. You know, you guys know. I mean, I think I think just it's just hard, you know. Yeah. Right. Well, I, I personally feel I'm not saying this because I want to sell more triangle beaters. Well, thought that wouldn't be a bad idea. I think you um, need, just need a lot. At a certain point, a music major, percussion major, should have their own beaters. Yeah, yeah, for cool. sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. If they sure. lose it, they lose it. Then they got to buy more, you know. Yeah. Well, that's, um, that's what we do at FU. As soon as ours had disappeared, I said, well, you guys are buying your own. And then, you know, I think they lose them slower that way. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the fastest when they're community beaters. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I, just want, I, just want them, I just want them to be tripping over them. I mean, because I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll go to Lowe's and we'll cut what we've cut metal before. I mean, yeah, we just have like... I, I don't think it's never that they can't find a beater. It's just the one they want, or or I look for the the one I want, and it's it's, it's not yeah, there you, when you need it's it. It's not there. Yeah. It's like, well, wait, it should be here. It should have come back, or you know, you guys know. But if they're creative, triangle beaters are the one thing implement one of the implements they can make for themselves. If yeah. They're, if they're resourceful. Yeah. 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 What else, Carly? That's yeah. Fun. Cool. Well, I have uh, some common, at least common in my experience, um, tambourine issues, which is sometimes you got to play like tri pack on a headless tambourine or, you know, one of those mountable ones Yeah. Uh, where I think the, the band director either doesn't know um, what's That's back there. Event. Just things like, hey, we got a tambourine. Cool. Let's do it. Um, so things like that or or God forbid you have to do, you know, thumb rolls, finger rolls. There's no beeswax anywhere in the school ever. Um, that mm -hmm. happens to see that an awful lot too. And kids say, how do you do it? How, like, how does it work? And they're like, well, hold on, I'll bring something that will make it all different and you'll, you'll get it. Um, and not necessarily a tambourine or triangle issue, but, um, also I see no black towels an awful lot. <laughs> and sometimes <laughs> it's like, it's the easiest thing to get. And I'll, I'll go to the same school and say like, Hey, we need these towels. Um, and it's like, go to Walmart, they're three bucks. It's so easy. And then, yeah. you know, you just see all kinds of different ways to, to get around that. <laughs> yeah, no, I was, I, when I was teaching at the University of Massachusetts up at Lowell here, I, I, students, that was one of the first things I had to bring a towel. I don't care what color, what size, bring a towel. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it's simple. Yeah, it's, it's uh, very simple. I, I always try to explain to them, and I'll either do it in a studio class or a freshman techniques class, I try to just spend about, 10 15 minutes explaining what an oboist goes through to make their reads and just to try to say like you just have to do a little preparation compared to what double reads have to do you know i mean they spend so long with their gougers and their tools oh, yeah. and their you know they spend so long getting the right materials and that's so key so look you just you have to understand some of that exists for percussion and that may be as simple as like 
taking an extra minute or two to get the right thing and another thing might be just like owning the right thing but usually that that really does it because they see like oh it could be much much worse and that's just that's part of this and that's part of this for those instrumentalists and that's part of this for these instrumentalists and okay this is my part you know that yeah. usually does the trick but. casey i think part of it is if we as percussionists ourselves don't take playing the triangle seriously or playing tambourine seriously we can't expect our colleagues in the orchestra or or in other uh, play other instruments to be take us seriously yeah. and i always approach the triangle as if you know i walk into a rehearsal or a concert there's 40 violins I'm the only one playing triangle. So it's all on me. Yeah. Now I don't I don't I don't profess that learning to play a triangle is as difficult as learning to play a violin. It is not. Mm -hmm. But learning to be a percussionist at that level is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. And triangle is part of that. And I walk in there, I you know, I tell this story, um, and forgive me if you've heard it, but I'll Many years ago, I would use the intermission at rehearsals at Symphony Hall to practice, you know, triangle or tambourine for 10 minutes rather than there's a 20 minute intermission. I don't need all 20 minutes, I, 10 minutes I could practice. So I'm in the back of the orchestra practicing sort of triangle roles. And most of my practicing is in the lower dynamics because I never have trouble playing triple forte. It's yeah. always triple piano. And so I'm practicing some really soft roles and the violins are walking past me in an old European violinist stops and he's looking at me and he's staring at me and he says, Neil, what are you doing? And I said, well, Cy, I'm practicing. And I'm, he says, you practice triangle, what a stupid instrument. I can't yes. believe you practice that. <laughs> Every course. child in um, Europe plays this instrument and you practice silly. You're being stupid. Yeah. So I let him, <laughs> I let him berate me. And when he was done, I said, Cy, I have, a, I have to ask you, that violin you're holding, is it expensive? He says, this a Guanarius, $200,000, and the bowl's 50000 I take a loan on my house to pay for it. And I said, well, this triangle is one of the best triangles in the world, and it costs $40, and we make the same amount of money every week. Now who's silly and who's smart? <laughs> and he, he didn't talk to me for a long time. But, and the, the point isn't that it's yeah. as hard to play, but it's, I take it as seriously as he takes playing a Guanarius violin. Yeah, sure. Course. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's cool. That's good. That's yeah. good. But it starts well, with us and our students. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Any others, Carly? Yeah. Here's a here's a related question for Neil. I was wondering if you have any advice for students establishing a practice regimen or routine um, for these instruments that we tend to neglect sometimes. Uh, yeah, I have a couple of suggestions. Actually, I first of all, it doesn't take an hour a day. I would I would use five minutes of practicing triangle, maybe the next day five minutes on a certain tambourine thing. If if someone could do five minutes three or four times a week consistently, you're going to be a master in the, on those instruments within a month. You're going to really get it down. Um, I have a very special uh, suggestion for tambourine shake rolls. One of my pet peeves is a shake roll. It's not really a shake roll. Everyone's shaking it too big. It's really very small motion. It's, a, it's more of a, just a vibration. It should be very quick. So what I used to do with my students, I'd always give them a special lesson in January here in Boston where I'd have them bring their bathing suit to the lesson and change into their bathing suit in the, in the bathroom. <laughs> Neil, we can't do that. I'd hand Neil. them. Well, maybe you can't do that now. It wasn't in my room. It was, We're not I'd hand them the tambourine and take them outside <laughs> and make them stand there for 15 minutes practicing the shake roll. And they were masterful when they came back they were blue but they 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 had it perfectly i gotta edit that out neil can't do it no <laughs> <laughs> that's good that's amazing that's funny that's really oh my uh, gosh it, carly it doesn't take i mean i think people they either do they don't do anything i mean five yeah. minutes a day is better yeah. than nothing uh it I, I used to i used to I used to have students who wouldn't do anything and then they'd get a hard tambourine part and panic. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, you know, I used to kid them at that time. There was a thing on TV, the Psychic Friends Network, where you'd pay money to call some psychic and they'd tell you, you know, about your life. I said, you can't call the Psychic Friends Network to have them tell you how to play this. You should just, if you don't go in knowing how to do it, being able to do it, you shouldn't be there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, five minutes a day. Yeah. Yeah. Question, Ben? 
Well, Neil, I had a follow-up question with that. What would you tell, uh, especially non-percussionist music educators, let's say a middle school band director, on how to steer their percussion section? I, I think the biggest mistake I see a lot of them make is they put their strongest players always on snare drum. Yeah. And I believe in rotation. I believe in building strength. In the, in the, and also, it, if you have the same players relegated to playing bass drum all the time, they lose interest. So I, you know, it always is amazing to me when I go into a middle school band or junior high and they put, they're playing scales and the kids are in the back there whacking the drums and quarter notes with, with the scales. Now that's not helping anybody. Yeah. So I always tell educators, get, get your percussionists out of the band room, put them in a practice room, mm -hmm. give them some exercises or have them watch videos to do something while you're working on pitch and scales and then bring them back in. And, yeah. and let you know assign one person a section leader and have that person the most motivated person try and get things uh, organized and and and, um, and observing and, and working with the other percussionists while you're working with the kids on scales. I mean, it's just amazing that the uh, music director's trying to hear intonation and kids are whacking away on snare drums. Cool. I think, uh, Megan, I think you have a little question. Oh, no, sorry. I'm jumping the gun. Carly, you have a question first. Sure, yeah. I'll go ahead. Um, this is a two-part question. Um, one is, Neil, what, what kind of starter equipment would you recommend for college students as they're starting to build their collections? And also maybe for school programs, um, just things that, like, standard equipment that everyone should own. Um. Are you talking, Carly, at a college level? Well, both. That's the two parts. One is maybe for college music majors, and then the other for okay. like a high school program. Okay, let me start with college music. College music major, if it's a percussion uh, focused, should have one good tambourine. And I would suggest something that's bright, that, that's articulate, like a German silver jingle or something that's kind of a do-all instrument. Uh, should have one good triangle. No smaller than six inches, no bigger than nine inches. A couple of triangle beaters and a good clip. Um, to me, those are those and those are prerequisites. Um, I would assume that the the student, as they go through the program, might get a pair of castanets and some of these smaller personal items. But tambourine triangle for sure. And I always wanted to have my own pair of cymbals. When I was in school, I bought a pair of 18 inch, no, they're actually 19 inch Zildjian's that were fairly medium light that I could play a lot of things with. I could play softly, I could play loud. And it's not so much that I didn't have access to good cymbals at the school, but I wanted to spend a lot of time with my cymbals and get to know them and learn how they react and live with them so I could play triple piano consistently just because I played that, those same pair of cymbals all the time. Rather than just pick up a pair at school and now I'm struggling because I'm not familiar with it. Um, mm -hmm. in, in high school, I see a, a big, um, a wide range. A lot of schools with, with really good music programs, the kids will have a tambourine, uh, usually not a triangle. Um, I think the school should own at least one tambourine, one good medium tambourine. Um, I'm suggesting more and more these days for schools, synthetic heads, because they don't, you know, they, they're durable and they don't have the issues with humidity, especially in places like Florida mm -hmm. and, and other places, Carly, as I'm sure you're familiar with, with oh, yeah. gets a lot of humidity. Um, uh, but the school should have, I, I think the school itself should own one or two good snare drums of five, five and a half, a six and a half, should own a tambourine or two, a, at least one triangle, a couple of pairs of cymbals, a, pair of, a set of castanets. Um, and I would, I would always, uh, defer to getting good quality instead of multiple units. In other words, instead of buying three sets of castanets, which I probably don't need buy one really good set of castanets. Yeah. Of course, the kids need to take care of them. That's the big issue is putting stuff away and caring for it and having respect for the instruments. It's a matter of keeping track for me of, okay, we've got these really great sets of instruments, but this set is the one that the our groups take on the road which is of a certain quality and then this set is that 
that we borrow to Stanton Summer Music Festival. And then this yeah. set is for uh, if there happens to be a high school band clinic we're hosting or there ha- like there's just like, oh, it's hard to right. it's hard to it's hard to keep all you that. Know going it right. happens and if, all the way up to the yeah. top we uh, years yeah. ago casey i was on a tour the orchestra was playing in um korea and we were playing the planets and i was playing assistant timpani and for whatever reason they didn't want to bring the second set of ringers that we had in boston and they said we're going to rent drums over there it's just one concert we're playing the planets and i i really try to get them not to do that but they did it yeah. i gave them specific sizes and makes make sure I get to the I get to the gig and the timpani are the wrong sizes, and uh, I called over the manager. I said I can't play it on these drums, and they called over the the Korean representative. There was this big to do, and there was a lot of kind of talking back and forth in Korean and and English. Are trying to resolve it, and then the Korean stage manager basically said the equivalent as well. Maybe that. The guy playing it doesn't know how to play these instruments, oh. <laughs> and I I came close to losing it. Pretty, I mean, uh, we resolved it. We were able to get a set there that evening at work, but you know, it, it's always challenging when you have multiple sets and some things travel, some don't. And right, you have to share. And, uh, gear, I'm not a good yeah. sharer. I'm not. I've never been a good sharer. I like my own things. <laughs> we have to share, Neil. We have to share. Well, you know, I don't like. I don't like sharing mallets. I don't like, you know, you know, especially the other night. I mean, I'm in playing these Christmas concerts this week and I've been ill. I mean, I have a cold. So I told the guys, I said, just be forewarned. You know, I'm, I have a cold. You don't want to touch my mallets. And we was, I was supposed to play cymbals in one number. And I said, Uh I don't think I should play cymbals. Let's swap out. I'll play the xylophone part. Why don't you stay? Just keep me away from the cymbals. Keep me away from anything that we have to share this Mm -hmm. week because you're going to get sick. (laughs) Yeah. Right, right. Uh, well, speaking of students, Megan, I think you got a little Facebook question from our buddy Josh Jones, right? Yeah, we've talked a little bit about students, um, Neil, and your experience teaching, but um, you know, we want to try to ask as many Facebook questions as we can. Sure. So we have one from Josh Jones, uh, where he asks. First of all, he says, "I'm so stoked for this episode," oh, cool. <laughs> and then he asks, "What motivates you, and how do you motivate your students?" You know, motivation has never been a problem for me. I mean, I am motivated all the time. Um, what motivates me? Hearing great musicians play, hearing Itzhak Perlman playing a piece of John Williams, um, uh, just taking a walk in the woods in New Hampshire in the winter, skiing. I, I find motivation in everything. I, I don't have mm-hmm. any problem. My, my students, I think I've always was able to instill a sense of passion in them, you know, and a lot of my students didn't go on to be professional players. Some of them were educators. Some, uh, one of my best students became a radiologist and, but he still loves music. And, and it, it's, to me, it's more about just the passion for whatever you do. It, it doesn't matter what you do. Just be passionate about it. Um, I, I really, um, indifference to me is, is something that really turns me off. Mm-hmm. I'd rather have somebody have an opinion one way or another and support that opinion. And mm-hmm. even if they don't agree with me, if they're passionate about it, I respect that. I might not agree, mm-hmm. you know, and I, I think, um, I'm, I, I mean, as you could tell, I'm fairly enthusiastic. I'm, I'm not kind of introverted at all. And, um, I just think life is short. You, you're here, enjoy it, have fun making music. Don't be afraid to make a mistake love every second and look around you because there's so much around us to find inspiration and to draw from and not just other musicians. It could be a piece of art. It could be, it could be a play. It, it could be a drive, drive down the road. It could be a lot of different things. And I always like yeah. doing, I have a lot of different interests. I mean, I'm, I do glass blowing I have other interests outside of music, which actually feed my music, my passion for music. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I hear music when I'm blowing glass. Mm-hmm. And not literally, uh, figuratively. I mean, there's, right. a, there's, a certain, there's a certain form and a certain pacing to working with uh, glass in a state of uh, molt, a molten state. 
that you have to time things and it, it's there's phrases and there's things. So I just find it all around me. I mean, I don't have any problems mm-hmm. finding finding inspiration. It, it's hard for me to imagine people who can't th- can look around and see it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's good advice. I think especially around this time of year for students, especially who, you know, have just gone through this long road of the fall semester <laughs> yeah. and are on winter break and starting to gear back up for the next semester that, you know, the motivation might not be the semester itself, but maybe looking for, for other things outside of the music that, that might help them get some energy. Oh, some of the best things you could do is stop practicing yeah. And go outside and and, yeah. and experience, you know, think about music in terms of a bigger a bigger world. Yeah. I mean, and and if I could just add because it came up in, in one of my panel discussions at PASIC because I I hear a lot of we say that a lot, you know, I see that Facebook posts a lot and I see people saying, you know, don't practice more, practice smarter and do things mm-hmm. like get out of the practice room, but like just to clarify to the kid or student that's only practicing 10 minutes a day or not even every day. Yeah. We're not talking about you. (laughs) We're talking about, (laughs) we're talking about the people who are like really going at it hard and are practicing like many hours a day. And, and to the people who say, (laughs) Oh, you need to not don't practice more practice smarter. Cause I've heard that argument from people who, find trouble being motivated to practice they'll say well i hear you're supposed to practice smarter and i'm just not really sure what that is and i say like well how much are you practicing just time wise and they're like not even hitting an hour a day it's like yeah we're not talking about you right 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 That's yeah like so problem. i don't know <laughs> and i mean of course i agree with you all you know but i think we have yeah. to we just have to clarify that more no no you're, you're you're right casey and i don't i don't mean to suggest kids could just practice a half an hour and then go for a walk in the woods all day or go skiing right Right, and we but, know you're saying that, of course. And I guess, I'm, yeah, and I'm not just talking about what you're saying either. I mean, I'm, I, I just see it a lot. Like, I feel like yeah. pe- people at our stage, we like to say this a lot. And we like to say stuff like, practice this way, not just more. And, you know, like like you see that a lot. But I think we, we forget, like, one crucial detail. <laughs> well, but, you know, Casey, to me, it was always like I, I'd have students practicing something. And when it came time to perform it, I don't, I used to say, I don't want to hear the sticking. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be aware of your technique. I want invisible technique. I want you to make music. You're, Mm -hmm. you're, you're playing notes, but you're not making music. I mean, I would just stop someone in the middle of a snare drum thing. And what are you saying? And they look at me like I'm nuts. Well, what do you mean? What am I saying? I said, yeah, what's this about? Yeah, yeah. So they're not, they haven't figured out how to break that wall and speak through it. And they haven't figured out. and, And, and to their credit, Students in in college is a, is a lot of material to learn, much more so than when I was in school. We didn't have all this marimba literature. I mean, I played mm-hmm. the Creston and the Kirka. Yeah. That was it, and the Mutsur Etude. But you know, we didn't have all this five octave stuff, and and it worries me today because students have a lot of pressure, and students who want to go on to take orchestral editions, it's just brutal. Yeah. And um, you know, to me, it's a it's a big crapshoot, and. And they feel they can't leave the practice room. And, and um, I wonder whether whether the payoff is really there. I don't know. Yeah. Concerned. Right. Gal, we could go. Yeah, that's another whole thing I'd love to ask you about sometime. I know. On air. Yeah, we'll have to have Neil Grover part two for sure. Yeah. But, uh, well, yeah. speaking of moving right along, you know, we're doing these every other week releases now. And so I, I didn't want to put any topics on the back burner just because we're moving uh, half as quick as we used to on this podcast. So we're going to go a little longer. But uh, I thought I'd give Neil another quick little break here because I did prepare a little sound for you guys this week. So if you want to go ahead, I don't think this isn't one where, uh, you know, I'm going to try to ask you to guess what this is. But uh, here's your sound for the week. An exciting new accessory which fits any guitar amplifier creates unbelievable sounds never before played on the guitar. Organ-like tones, mellow woodwinds and whispering reeds, booming brass and bell clear horns, plus many, many more. And then there's one little bit here. Listen to this next one carefully. The same electric bass, but now a big bass saxophone effect. (laughs) 
All right, Neil, does that remind you of anything, maybe from the 60s? It reminds me of my uh, my friend playing with his fuzz, we used to call it a fuzz face. Wow. Turning a guitar into a fuzz face. Wow, you know what? That's hilarious, because this thing is called the Maestro Fuzz Tone. Yeah. What What is a fuzz face? Fuzz is that face. just a... Jimi Hendrix used the fuzz... Fuzz yeah. face. It was a brand of fuzz. It was, a, it was a guitar effect. You plug your guitar into it, and it was on the floor, and it was round, and it they had like these step these little buttons that you could step on to, to turn it on. It looked like a face called the fuzz face. Yep. Yep. Wow. Yeah. Well. Well. That's wow. So, that's really that's cool. Yeah, that's familiar. <laughs> I, I was looking back through the year, and I was looking at you know some of the people we talked about, like we talked about Vita Chenoweth passing away. And we talked about Aretha Franklin at one point, and I was going to do a segment. Maybe we still should do a segment on uh, the jazz singer Nancy Wilson. Mm -hmm. So uh, in in that same bunch was this person named Glenn Snowdy, who was a radio engineer turned sound engineer. And he created this, what I've, as far as I can tell, is the first ever distortion pedal. Mm -hmm. So pedal, like pedal effects for guitars and keyboards came around in the 50s, but they were mostly doing tremolo, so like wah-wah pedal. And Mm -hmm. I forget what the very first one was called, but it it was for tremolo, yeah, for the speed of just the volume up and down. And the first distortion pedal was this one in 1962. Glenn Snowdy created it. And it was made famous by Keith Richards, who a lot of us may not know is the guitarist for the Rolling Stones. And I never got into the Stones, so this isn't this isn't in, uh, something I know. But um, yeah, the song was "Can't Get No Satisfaction," so that made the Maestro Fuzzbox really, really popular. And then he sold sold many of them. So anyway, yeah, remember Glenn Snowdy, he died in May of 2018 and he created the first distortion pedal. I know this is a percussion podcast, but I think those of you who know me know this is one of my interests and especially one of my current growing interests. So something I was going to ask you guys is do you still or oh sorry, do you um do you really know what distortion is? Because I didn't, I really didn't <laughs> until I kind of started reading about this a little bit. So I took an I acoustics class in undergrad and we talked kind of about it with like the sound waves clipping. Is... Yeah, that's exactly yeah. it, Ben. And I, yeah. and I know you guys, I know everyone on this call knows the distortion sound, but a lot of new music today, it's really it might not be in a lot of that music. So I just prepared a quick little comparison for you. Here's our introduction without distortion, followed by one with. Hopefully you can still hear that. And then now, of course, with distortion. So that may not be familiar to some of our younger listeners, but that's the effect it does. And Ben, you're exactly right. It does something called clip the sound. So if you take a look at this, and hopefully you guys can see a graphic on your screen right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You yep. probably still still see Skype. But um, yeah, right here, there is the, a, a regular wave, right? The blue, the thing in blue. Uh-huh. And it's, it's within the window of the amount of signal that it's meant to receive. So this thing called VC, plus VC up top and minus VC down below, that stands for voltage. And, uh, and, and that can, um, that's basically like how much power whatever medium we're listening through can handle. So they'll sometimes call that the ceiling and they'll call the space between the top of the peak of the wave and the ceiling, the headroom. So if you turn your gain up on an amplifier, it'll start to hit that ceiling. And if you can exceed that ceiling by overdriving it, as they say, you'll create what's in the green wave there. It'll cut that off and you'll lose mm. a part of the sound and distort it. So that's really all distortion is, is what the, what I'm showing there in green. So Casey, when now, you have that up, yeah. here's an interesting little thing to think about. Oh, yeah, please. The blue sine wave. Yeah. It was, you, if we were to look at a flute and an oscilloscope, it would look very, very close to that blue sine wave. If right. you were to look at a clarinet or an oboe, it would be more of like a sawtooth, more uh-huh. similar to the clipped wave there with, with, with sharper edges. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's, it's not really clipping, but the, the waveform shape, which is the timbre of the instrument, um, 
is is critical in the orchestra to the, giving each instrument its characteristic sound. Yeah, absolutely. So so that's really cool. And it's uh, aside from what we're what distortion is, but yeah, Neil's totally right. So it, it's fun in music appreciation class when you're talking about tone versus. Uh, pitch or timbre versus pitch you say exact show exactly what neil said to like make that distinction because everyone's kind of like well tone timbre pitch it's all kind of like the same right it's like no it's not we probably use them too much too casually but there is uh. definitely a distinction but uh yeah usually when uh, at least in this little graphic i found they're showing the they're showing like a perfectly clean sine wave so yeah nothing from overtones and no extra mess that may be there, but yeah, no, I mean, very few sounds we actually listen to are this perfect and clean and smooth. So, mm-hmm. yeah, but that, that, that's, that's, that's really it for, for this. So, so you can imagine uh, whatever, you know, the digital effects we use now, they're basically doing this process. They're, they're clipping, like Ben said, inside of the, the, the voltage region, but they're bringing it down in volume so that it's not, stressing any anything physical on the equipment and of mm-hmm. course we can manipulate them so much and you can imagine if we were to turn that green signal up so high that all of it was out of the contained area you would just mm-hmm. lose the sound entirely and i know some of the music we all we all are listening to these days like there's so much distortion sometimes that you can't even tell like what what was the rhythm there it's just messy 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 and that's just a whole whole lot of distortion so yeah. I think that's um yeah, I think that's that's it. And of course in the beginning a lot of musicians were trying to get these sounds like nice. the famous story is the guitarist of the Kinks slashing his uh amplifier like slashing the speaker so that it would uh it would create distortion and then eventually that was a desired effect and now of course it's um yeah, I mean I I wouldn't know rock and roll without it. Mhm. Yeah, so that's it's interesting how music. how like distortion has made its way into contemporary music. Also, you know, distortion is often like a a process in in a max patch or something that's applied oh, yeah. to live sound, and it's interesting how it's caught on in other genres. Also, oh yeah, I mean, it's so it's such a useful thing, I think, and it's just so in our ears now. You know, no, Casey, it, it, interesting is I I mean, this makes me think. In the 60s, when um, Bob Moog invented the Moog synthesizer, and there was uh, Walter Carlos, who became Wendy Carlos, that switched on Bach, it started this whole kind of craze. And I got caught up in that. And then I was actually working with one of Bob Moog's associates for a while in New York on a Moog synthesizer. And we had an oscillator with patch cords going into filters. It was all analog sound. That's awesome. But, But I have a picture somewhere, and I have... I don't know what's longer, my hair or the long patch cords. I'll have to dig that out somewhere. <laughs> see, see, I want to see that picture. You would be shocked. My hair was huge. See, Neil, now I remember the, the start of the episode. I said, you just drop, you like, you've been with these composers and these people that you just drop their names like it's no big deal. And here's another one. This Bob Moog. Bob yeah, Moog. So see, that's, yeah, yeah, what, that's what I'm, yeah. that's what I'm after. Well, I think. Neil, we have one more question okay. for you on Facebook, and it's from our friend Brandon Arve. And Brandon asks, Neil, Grover Pro is one of the most recognizable percussion brands in the world. To what do you attribute this level of global popularity? Well, I'm going to answer it. I think you just knew everybody. You knew Copeland. You knew Moog. Uh, oh, one of the advantages of being around a long time, I think, if you could survive. <laughs> you know. <laughs> no, sorry. What's the, what's the real answer here? Well, look, honestly, the reason I kind of got into it and kept going and kept expanding is because for many, many years, the larger drum companies didn't care. They didn't Mm -hmm. make instruments for percussionists. It was a small market compared to rock and roll. The big money to be made was in rock and roll from the 60s going through through the 90s into the 2000s. Um, It's only kind of... Um, recent that a, a number of companies uh, and really not many American companies uh, started paying more attention to the educational and the orchestral and symphonic marketplace. And that's why in the 80s you had companies like Malatech, Mike Balter, Grover Pro pop up. We were all players and guys who wanted to 
and gals who wanted to make instruments to fill a niche. Mm -hmm. And so because we are players and we know what they should sound like and what we want to do, it's a big advantage. So Mm -hmm. it's been, a you know, these brands have been around a long time, but as I tell people, Zildjian, which is arguably probably the most well-known percussion brand in the world. Okay. I mean, Zildjian, the drummer is on South Park. How many, how many companies have a South Park character? Uh, (laughs) Right. So um, it's, it centered the, it centered the, um, vernacular of of people who are not knowledgeable musicians but a company like zildjian which is a big company in our industry is basically a small business in the real world the music industry is not a big industry uh so um the competition sometimes is not i mean there's not dozens and dozens of triangle companies just because the market can't sustain it yeah so it's small so there's a certain um, advantage of being small and, and filling a niche and being around a long time. Uh, a, a couple of years ago, we were at PASIC and I'm standing at the booth and I usually would bring three or four people with me. And I hear a young woman asking a question saying, my teacher sent me over here to get a Grover tambourine. I'm not sure which one to get. Can you help me? And one of my staff said, well, why don't you ask Neil Grover? He's standing over there. And I hear her say, Neil Grover, is he still alive? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, like, I'm standing 10 feet and you know, that's the joke in the office now. And yeah, I'm kind of a lot, of course. but to someone who's in college today, it's always been around. I mean, even though it's only since 1980, that's not a real long time. Right. Right. Uh, but you know, well, well that's great. You guys, we have point. our, our quiz to do here at the little at the end. Oh, and I haven't even told Carly about this. So Carly, basically, I do what we call podcast speed trivia. So <laughs> we keep score, and if you know the answer, just type me in the chat, and you get you get a point. So all the material on this little quiz, and Neil, you're welcome to. I have to dive type in. me, Emmy, just Emmy. Well, since you're our guest, you can just oh. shout it out. Okay, I, well, I, I probably won't know the answer anyway. <laughs> well, you might. I have a feeling that you will, you might know some of these. So, um, yeah, all this information comes from past episodes, and it's a way we kind of recap, and it's also a way we uh, kind of uh, review. So uh, it's, it's fun for us because we cover a lot of stuff, and sometimes we cover it very quickly, and sometimes we cover it pretty in-depth. But, uh, yeah, anyway, so I've even – I'm traveling, so I don't have my regular metronome. Ooh, that's loud, isn't it? But I've got this one. Can you guys hear that? Yeah, it's good. Yes. Okay. So, see, the metronome kind of makes it like a game show, Neil. <laughs> do, you, do you feel like you're on a game show? I do. I do. <laughs> Thank you. I hear you. <laughs> okay. So, this is a, a little question called, Who Am I? So, who am I? I premiered our first marimba concerto, studied with George Hamilton Green and Claire Omar Musser. It's kind of an easy one. Performed in the King George Marimba Ensemble and was the timpanist of the New York City-based Orchestra Classique. Who, who's that? Was it Ben? Ben. I think it was me. All right, Ben, what do you got? Ruth Stuber. Yeah. Do you remember her other name? Ruth Jean was, I think, her married name. Yeah, yeah, wow. very nice. Wow. Yeah, so we t- we talked about this way back on episode yeah. seven. That's Ruth Stuber or Ruth Jean. Right. So yeah, and apparently Paul Creston was in the audience. And the 1940 program notes stated that the concertino was the only work ever written for this instrument in any serious form. Jean was the timpanist also with the orchestra classique that that New York based all female orchestra. And Ben told us also on the episode that she was approached later by John Cage to perform in some art gallery where she played the xylophone part to Henry Cowell's uh, ostinato pianissimo. So anyway, that's fun. Okay, second questions. So good job, Ben. And okay, who am I? This artist is famous for performances and recordings of the 1928 electronic instrument, the Ons Martineau. This is a tough one. Let's say Ons Wife. Um, um, uh, 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 Yeah. Is that right? Okay, so I know someone different, but did Messian's wife play the on Martino? Oh, yeah, that was her specialty. Wow. Oh, yeah. Okay, we got to get her name. You don't know her, you don't know her name oh, offhand. I'll think of it in a minute. Um, ben, can you go to Google? Yeah, I'm Googling it. Uh, she, she might have introduced the instrument. She may, Maybe she was... I don't think she invented it, but... Um, 
She did not invent it. We talked but about she it. Was there was a, a guy named Martin. Yeah. Right. Is it uh, Yvonne Leroy? It sounds right. Okay. Or sounds French. Yeah. Elbows. That could be it. Well, Neil, you totally deserve a point. I didn't know that name, but the one we talked point. about on the podcast huh? was Genevieve Grenier. So she is still out there playing and soloing on the On Martin wow. and make, wow. writing albums. Wow. Uh, I believe she's based in Canada. She's French Canadian, I believe. But we talked about her on episode 154, mm -hmm. Josh Jones's episode. And she gets to call herself an on -disti. Yeah, or on because she plays the on Martin. No, she's on wow. soloist. So, yeah, wow. she's one of the few. I know, isn't that cool? She's one of the few <laughs> making a performing career on the on Martin. No, and apparently there's some conservatory in France where you can still get, get either a degree or a, some performance diploma studying on Martin. No, but I think that is the only one. So, yeah, Neil, you're on the scoreboard. Wow. It, yeah. It looks like. Uh, I actually, I think it looks like his uh, sister-in-law, Jean Leroy, was the oh. uh, person Neil's thinking of. From his sister-in-law. Yeah. Okay. So how many? Okay, man. How many points? Time ago. All how right. many points should I take away from Neil? Take a half away. Take away five points for that one. <laughs> Give him the point. I think I think half no, a no. point's fair. He, he no. deserves a point for sure. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Okay. Give him the okay. point. Okay, last question. This one's much easier. I performed on Saturday Night Live, and I've been on the podcast, but I'm not Valerie Naranjo. Oh, All right. shit. All right, Ben. <laughs> Bill Mersh. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Cool. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. That's good. Okay, cool. Hey, well, you guys, thanks so much for joining on episode oh, 172, I think wow. I said. so. Yeah, yeah. And Neil, thanks so much. It's so well, guys, fun thanks for having me. It's great to hang with some younger percussionists and I really appreciate your questions and, and your interest and thanks so much. And I wish you all a happy new year. Yeah, happy new year to you, you too. too. And okay. yeah, we'll catch you everyone. The the next episode we'll be recording will be in the new year. So yeah, thanks everyone. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Ben, Megan, and Carly, we'll catch you later. Sounds Shall good. We? All right, bye. 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 bye.